Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us the Telehealth Failures and Secret Success webinar. Today, we have a treat for you guys. I think you guys have seen uh, Logan Plaster and Dr. Plaster's name all over the place on the internet. Again, these are two of the really the key leaders of the whole uh, telehealth industry. So they ran the magazines. You see their just like also the stories from them. So we are, I'm really honored and to have both of them joining us today. I think you're going to really enjoy what they have to say. Uh, just as an uh, intro, inside, interesting background, um, so uh, Logan is responsible, the editor of two publications, but on top of his full-time, just grinning craziness, uh, he's also a full-time father of a one-year-old and a three-year-old. And one of the most overwhelming experiences he has ever experienced is the India's uh, Maha Kumbha Mala in the India in 2013, but this is about like 100 million people gathering for the pilgrims to Washington, which is like, he thought it was amazing <laughs> for him to experience that. And then um, uh, Dr. Um, Plaster, um, again, so on top of being from editor of successful magazines, a businessman to Marine, he actually saved uh, President Joe Biden's uh, life <laughs> through by treating his brain aneurysm a while back. And on top of that, during his fifth grade, he was actually a key witness of busting a drug ring. So again, his spectrum, the accomplishments is a wide range. Again, we're very privileged, honored to have both of them uh, joining us today. Um, I guess uh, what we do is uh, each of them will present, a, share a couple of slides, their thoughts on what they have seen at South by Southwest, uh, some of the major trends on the telehealth space. Again, then we'll have some free form conversation. I guess, um, Logan, do you want to kick it off? <laughs> sure. Thanks, Milton. I really appreciate you allowing us to come on and appreciate the work that, that you've done with this webinar and just getting information out there. So I'll just jump right in. I try to be uh, relatively concise uh, in my work editing telemedicine. I get to talk to a lot of CEOs. Uh, almost once a day, I'm talking to somebody who leads a company in the health tech space and the, the value propositions, they span the gamut. And so uh, when you asked us to talk about trends, um, that was challenging, but in the conversations that I've had recently, there was one thing that really stuck out as something that I wanted to, wanted to mention. Um, and so instead of talking about five different trends, I really want to drill down into one big idea and separate it out into its few component parts. Um, and this is something that I think is optimistic for the market and something that's gen genuinely exciting. So the, the big idea is that uh, I'm seeing more and more companies uh, moving beyond what I'm gonna call shiny toy syndrome and into an area of, into an era of critical infrastructure building. Um, you know, I think we're moving away from uh, as many get rich quick app ideas and into the area of building durable infrastructure. And, um, you know, new gadgets and one off concepts are great, but they present a couple of key problems that I've gotten to see firsthand over the last three years, uh, which is the first idea is the idea of conflicting technology. Uh, we're seeing, you know, I, I have a friend who runs a telemedicine program in a hospital. And he's got three different telemedicine programs that he has layered one on top of another. One for in-hospital telemedicine, one for um, direct-to-consumer. He's got a third program for uh, remote uh, patient monitoring. And these systems are layered one on top of another, and it's, it's really kind of, a, kind of a nightmare for him. Okay? And the second problem is simply app overload. And this we've seen with the magazine year after year with, there are nearly 260,000 medical apps on the, two, on the two app stores. And so you have to ask yourself, how many apps does the average consumer actually need? What is the appetite for apps? There's nothing wrong with a good medical app. There's nothing wrong with a good new gadget. Um, we have to ask ourselves these questions. Um, you know, there's some really exciting ones that I'm excited about, like, uh, like Adicade, which is a new app for addiction treatment. And there's, a, there's an app that, uh, that we just interviewed the founders of called Cold Gene. 
that's basically the Airbnb of genetic testing. So there's really there's cool stuff coming out. Um, however, with 260,000 apps on the market, you have to you have to really ask some critical questions. And um, one of the things that we do each issue of Telemedicine is we do a a post mortem, and you can pretty quickly start to see the the tombstones pile up of shiny gadgets, uh, technology that uh, seemed on its face to have the funding, it had the look, and yet um, and yet went belly up. And it, it, and again, it's not for not for lack of funding. So the trend that I am excited about is that, in my humble opinion, what I'm seeing is that 2017 is about building the bridges and roads of tomorrow's healthcare system. Uh, and learning from the companies who are doing this infrastructure work really well. So what I wanted to do was, really quick, I wanted to give three examples of what I mean, three companies that I see doing this well. One of the benefits of being um, the editor of Telemedicine Magazine is that we get to talk to everyone, and I have, no, I have n nothing vested in any of these companies or any of the apps that I mentioned. These are just companies that I see doing great work, in this particular way and companies that I think that people can learn from. And so we're just going to go through quickly. The first one is Pocket Doc. So lots of people know about Pocket Doc. Lots of people are working with Pocket Doc. But Pocket Doc refers to itself as the infrastructure of digital health. They're trying to be the undergirding of the system. They trade in back-end interoperability. They build these APIs that allow disparate systems to communicate with one another. They do the hard work of working with the insurance company and with the healthcare system to make sure that everyone gets paid. And mm -hmm. they develop novel uses of blockchain technology. And so... I don't see the slide update uh, here. Say again? Uh, we don't see the slide update. Uh, uh, what I slide is it on right now? We see on the first slide. Oh, it's not moving forward. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't. It has not been moving forward through my slides. Right. <laughs> no, it's, in fact, I, only, I think it might be um, you're you're actually sharing the uh, slide editor, but versus right now you're in the slide uh, viewer. So if you just X out of the viewer and just go back to editor just before, that should be fine. If I X out of the viewer. Yeah, just a PowerPoint viewer. Just escape it. Uh -huh. Just escape, OK. And then show. And then you should be able to, uh, whatever the, your, the PowerPoint editor the, for you. Mm -hmm. So we'll have the license. But you saw my first slide, but it's not advancing through them. Right. So I have show, PowerPoint. There you go. There you go. Are we good now? The big idea. See the big idea? Yeah. OK, so I won't repeat anything I've said, but you see the big idea. And shiny toys are fun, but they rarely move the needle. So uh, we're going to move forward to the three examples. I want to start with Pocket Doc. You guys seeing what I'm look at showing you? I see the big idea. OK. I'm now on the pocket doc slide. Is it somehow getting stuck? No, yeah, I'm still seeing the. Um, in the yeah, I apologize for this. It's like the go to me <laughs> that I think there. So are you, so because of the way the PowerPoint works, is there's an editor plus the, the presenter in there. So the presenter is a different. I guess, are you looking at the? OK, okay. now we see the television. Yeah, shiny toys. Let's see if it works this way. How's that? Now yep. it's working. Perfect. <laughs> I'll go through it manually then. OK, cool. So okay. Um, so we talked about the, uh, the post-mortem that we do and this idea that it's not for lack of a beautiful front-end design. And it's not for lack of funding. And so it's exciting to me to see that these companies are building this infrastructure. So we're going to give three examples. You still, you still tracking? Yep. OK. So the first one's Pocket Doc. And the big idea is that Pocket Doc is building this back-end infrastructure, right? They are doing the APIs, interoperability. And the big point is that they are doing hard-to-quantify back-end work 
to make the health system work together. I mean, they really are, they really are doing work that's difficult to quantify. It's difficult to market. It's difficult to put a face on. And it took a heck of a long time to do. Uh, I mean, just try to start explaining to somebody how they are applying blockchain in novel ways to bring the entire system together. Uh, this is something that I've been working on wrapping my head around myself. But the point is, um, more and more of the system is being powered by the hard work that they're doing on the back end. And it has, it has the, that, those marks of being the infrastructure of the system of, of the future. So the next company I want to bring up is called Supa. And Supa is a smaller outfit out of New York's startup health. And Supa is interesting, probably a little less well known to, to everyone. Um, Supa is trying to be an industry agnostic way to add health tracking sensors to every type of clothing, from a Levi's jean jacket to your favorite pair of, uh, of pants. They want to be the intel inside of, of health tracking. They're adding artificial intelligence into fashion, but in a completely seamless way. Uh, and they like to compare themselves to the YKK group, which is uh, <laughs> the largest producer of, of zippers. Uh, they, they, want to be, they want to be built in, they want to be baked in. And what I love about this is that they're creating this amazing product, but they don't care who knows their name. And they want to build the intelligence system on the back end that's going to make longitudinal data tracking possible. They, <laughs> they're not creating a one-off product. They're not creating, uh, even though they're starting with some athletic wear, the idea is to be absolutely industry agnostic and to not be one more layer, but to be baked in into everything that you do. They're thinking, uh, generations ahead, the idea is to have it so seamless that you're tracking health data for years, and when you finally get sick, uh, you have a body of data that you can lean back on. And so they're following this trend as well. And third company I want to mention is called Health Navigator. Health Navigator is led by a team of physicians who wanted to create the brain behind smart machine triage. They have no desire to create front-end applications, uh, they don't want to create any direct-to-consumer products. They just wanted to have a team of physicians create the right algorithms that would help you know what your diagnosis is based off of a series of chief complaints and statistically where you should go for care. So, in other words, what's important about that is that, again, they are industry agnostic. From Microsoft to a local telemedicine startup, they will give, they will sell this brain to, to anyone, okay? And what they're doing, what makes it so interesting, is that they are building, they're putting the time and effort into building building blocks rather than front-end uh, beautiful software. They, they're building the building blocks in order to help the system forward, bring the best clinical data that the market has uh, to the forefront. And so that's just a quick, a quick overview of three companies that excite me because they seem to fall in line with this trend of building infrastructure. And I think that the, um, the thing that I wanted to impart is that there are great lessons that people can learn from these companies when they think about infrastructure and what it is that is propelling these, these companies forward. First thing is that building infrastructure is costly. Um, to, to repair one mile of highway in an urban area costs three to five million dollars, right? Um, the working through the mathematical formulas to be interoperable with Epic and to create new ways of using blockchain to communicate between institutions takes time, it takes resources, and the future is going to involve budgeting accordingly for those kinds of things. The second principle I've seen is that building infrastructure takes time. Um, just, a, just a few years ago, med tech development meant uh, coming up with an app that could help you do a medical calculation, uh, whereas Health Navigator spent 17 years cumulatively in research to put together the brain of machine learning triage. And to really move, move the needle, uh, they, are gonna have, they had to put in that time and build that highway. They had to do the work and 
And I think that the, the takeaway that I would want people to hear would be that you, just like they won't, you can't expect to be recognized for that kind of work overnight. And the really solid work, the enduring work is going to take time. Um, and it's worth work worth doing. The third principle I want to say was um, that building of infrastructure can go underappreciated. So Suma's, um, Supa's uh, founder, uh, Sabine Seymour, she really likes likening Supa to the YKK group because this idea of uh, the ubiquitous um, zipper, uh, everyone uses a YKK zipper, and until I Googled it, I had no idea what she was talking about. It's, it's, it's worked into everything. It's, it's a product that you rely on, and yet you don't necessarily appreciate. And so the people who have gone into these three companies initially have been willing to do work that isn't particularly flashy, doesn't make great headlines, isn't necessarily going to make for a splashy homepage on a website. Uh, and yet, truly, again, are the building blocks for the future. And so my encouragement for other companies would to, to be to embrace this ethos and to do work that uh, has that enduring value, whether it has a humble zipper-like quality to it or not. And then the last thing I'd say would, is that building infrastructure is absolutely essential. And there, you know, with 260,000 apps in the market, you know, we see an awful lot of technology that is uh, a one-off concept. It might be just an idea to get somebody wealthy today, but I believe that the next wave of, uh, of medical technology innovation is going to have to be in this area um, of, of building infrastructure that is essential not just for today, but is actually these are projects that are good for our children, and good for our children's children. Um, when I talked to Supa's founder, Dr. Seymour, uh, her goal is to encourage young people to track their health so that 30 years from now, uh, they have a body of data and they've been gathering it seamlessly so that when they get sick, they can, um, they can compare it across a spectrum of data. Uh, and so, you know, my encouragement when I hear these, when I read about these companies and talk to these CEOs, my encouragement for other people is to, to think big like this. Think about building building blocks that are not just for ourselves, but the building blocks for another generation or even society as a whole. And they're showing that it's possible. And, um, and so I find that incredibly exciting. So that's the final point. I think my, my big takeaway is that uh, these are exciting times. Um, this trend is reasonably optimistic about the future of healthcare technology. And um, I'm excited to see what, uh, what's, what's new with the ATA and who else is sort of taking this mantle on. So with that, I will uh, hand back the control. <laughs> Logan, that was fantastic. And I, I feel like uh, I couldn't agree with you more on that, from the, going from the sexy app to basically like quick, quick rich versus actually doing something fundamental in there. I think from our experience, is healthcare just is hard, right? This is not something like you have an idea, you go to the garage, you hack something out, you make some money. Really, it's like you have to be committed to doing this industry. You have to be committed to this thing. I really, really appreciate your thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, so we're going to uh, switch gear to, uh, I guess, for uh, <clears throat> uh, Mark, do you, uh, um, uh, can you share your slides? Or, um, okay, no, I, I still see Logan's slides here. Oops. Okay. We're going to make the switch and uh, give okay. us one second. Uh, there we go. Okay, good deal. Uh, even though Logan's my son, we obviously uh, have a lot of different ideas about a lot of different things. I'm into shiny toys. I like uh, get-rich-quick schemes, and uh, <laughs> so I'm going to present to you something very, very different than uh, what my forward-looking uh, uh, son has been talking about. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the, the top ten, the telemedic uh, top five telemedicine opportunities. Uh, don't misunderstand. I, I don't see these as Get, get rich quick schemes, but they are, I'm a clinician, okay, I'm a clinician, and I deal with day-to-day -day problems, and I'm looking for, for things that will uh, change, that will move the needle tomorrow, tomorrow, 
Uh, I know there's there. Uh, you know, Logan talks about uh, building roads, and I think those are absolutely correct. However, the roads of today were gravel paths of yesterday, which became two lane roads that which then became four lane roads. And yes, we did build a lot of roads that went to nowhere and didn't uh, didn't work right. That you look at the canals that we have, okay. But the point of it is, they started someplace. And I think there's a lot of folks out there that that want to know where can I get started? Where can I start tomorrow? Um, I'm not the kind of uh, guy who can build the infrastructure of, of you know an eight lane highway now, but I'm, I I want to do something. So I'm going to show you something that you can do. Uh, particularly with clinicians or if you're a hospital administrator or five areas that I think that you can get involved in. Thus the, let me see if this clicks down. It didn't do that so let me see if I try this one. Oh, there you see that one? Yeah, actually uh, Mark, if you could make that window bigger, I see mostly it's your desktop. If you just make that PowerPoint window like maybe full screen. Uh, play. Like that? Um, I think, do you have multi, okay, yes, perfect. Oh, did it work? Yeah, that, that worked. The... Okay. Perfect, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. the, the full screen now? Perfect. This is like, okay, yeah. I don't see you, but I, I see that, uh, I see that bad boy that I'm looking at right now. Uh, <laughs> this is the time of year that everybody starts peeling off their clothes and they start seeing things that they didn't see last year. Uh, and uh, and they're, they're wondering, what the heck is that? Is it one of those bad, bad uh, diseases that I need to have, uh, that I have, uh, and um, that I've been spending billions of dollars on uh, sunscreen to prevent, and yet I see this thing that I'm looking at, and is it a melanoma? That's the question. I will tell you that 280 million people right now uh, have will, will at some point look at something, some lesion on their skin, and say, is that a melanoma? Um, you know, I don't see uh, it. So, uh, Teladerm presents an opportunity. Uh, let me see if I go to the next slide. There we go. Teladerm presents uh, an opportunity for uh, people to meet a, a, a need that is right now, answer a very specific question. Teledermatology has had trouble because it tried to be too many, uh, too many things to too many people. There is one question, and that is, what is this mole? What is this mole? And the fact of the matter is that uh, it is the most prevalent cancer in America. 60% of primary care referrals uh, to dermatologists turn out to be inappropriate, and everyone has at least one worrisome thing. It's a site triage. And the point of it is, here is an opportunity for a, a, an individual who teams up with a dermatologist, even if a dermatologist is not already doing it, to, um, to get people to send pictures uh, of uh, lesions, and uh, get into a dermatologist's office essentially uh, by being pre-screened, okay? Uh, I've, I've had a, a melanoma years ago, and, so, and as a result of that, I had to go to a dermatologist every six months for a body scan. Let me tell you, it's like being the star of a peep show. You strip down naked and you stand there and the guy goes up and down your body with a, with a uh, uh, magnifying glass. It's humiliating, and I quit going for that very reason. Uh, I'm telling you that, that there are still lots of lesions that people have that they would like to know what they are and if they could take a picture of it in the privacy of their home and send it to somebody and, and you could make the, the, the call that yes, this needs to be screened by, by a dermatologist or a biopsy or no, this is some other kind of lesion that you needn't worry about. Those are simple things that need to be done and I, and I, I think that it's likely, I think it's been proven in fact that people will be happy to, to spend a little bit of money on that. Number four, number four, tele-ICU, okay? This is one of the, the, the problems with um, uh, small hospitals, and I just read the other day that another hospital, a small hospital had, had uh, gone under, had closed its doors. And one of the reasons is that the really sick people always get sent out, and the really not so sick people get sent home. And so what happens is that the function of the community hospital has largely found, it's, it, they found themselves in the middle. And um, the, if they could utilize tele-ICU, utilize teleconsultation, they would be able to keep their doors open to the community that they're in. It brings smaller hospitals. And from the, if you are at a, at a large tertiary care center, which is, uh, someone watching this uh, 
this uh, seminar uh, would likely to be. It, you can bring hospitals into your network. Uh, it allows marginal patients to stay, uh, stay local. You're the, the intensivists, the in, emergency physicians, the qualified uh, practitioners that you have in your facility are able to extend their capabilities to these smaller hospitals and the ones that don't need to come stay there and they feel comfortable holding them at that hospital and taking care of them. The ones that, that need to come will come to your hospital. Uh, that expands your network. It's, it's a win-win. Um, it screens out inappropriate referrals. One of the things that uh, in emergency medicine that we know about are uh, EMTALA referrals, uh, patients who get sent to tertiary care centers who really and truly don't need to be there. Um, and tele-ICU and teleconsultation, even from the emergency department, is a way to do that. Uh, the, the technology is already there. There are people like uh, uh, all over the country that are currently doing it. And I would say that if you are a hospital administrator uh, in a competitive market and you have smaller outlying hospitals that you would like to start referring into your facility, the way to do that is to institute a program in tele-ICU, tele-ER. Um, it obviously brings teleconsultants uh, to the uh, rural areas as well. Next, number three. We're working ourselves down from five. Um, telemonitoring, okay? This is um, a chronic conditions. Uh, again, the vast majority of the money that we're spending in healthcare right now is on chronic conditions. It's really the top three or four, diabetes, COPD, CHF. And hospitals that have an impact, uh, that are impacted by global budgeting, uh, are going to want to work to keep these folks out of their hospitals if they can. And um, by doing so, you as a clinician or you as a hospital entity, if you can treat these folks at home uh, by using uh, lower level uh, uh, providers or concentrating the, the decision making of the providers through a telemonitoring system, uh, you can save money. Uh, you can save money for the individual um, and certainly you'll be the darling of the insurance company who's taking care of them because uh, your, uh, your cost will be, will be lowered as well. It becomes a, 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 clin a clinical practice of dashboards and case managers versus patients being sent to the ER. It's, it's pretty simple. It's like uh, uh, everyone who knows much about telemedicine already knows uh, about uh, diabetes management where you can, uh, where your, gluco your glucometer uh, is hooked up to a dashboard someplace so that they can see whether you're testing and they can see what your, your glucose uh, uh, reading is for that day. But more importantly, it can be tagged into uh, or attached to uh, counseling, uh, a variety of uh, other kinds of case management compliance issues that will uh, help keep the patient out of the hospital, at least the ones that can be managed at home. And again, in the world of global budgeting, that's, that is going to be more and more and more important. Number two, telepsychiatry, okay? This is uh, what I believe is uh, an area, telepsychiatry and telecounseling, okay? I, I'm part here in Maryland, uh, and I, I think you saw my uh, coffee cup. Uh, here in Maryland, I'm uh, on the governor's task force to deal with the heroin problem. And uh, one of the things that we have found is that we can get, we can concentrate these uh, patients all into one campus, and then everybody within a half a mile of that campus uh, complains about having all the heroin addicts in town uh, in one area, and it completely. Uh, they feel that it completely destroys the area. When we've talked about uh, expanding and decentralizing uh, these efforts, uh, the one thing that has been difficult to do is what do you do about counseling? Uh, because counseling is the most important um, part of, or one of the more important parts of uh, the opioid treatment for the opioid uh, epidemic and the opioid dependent. And telepsychiatry offers an opportunity to uh, use a psychologist, a psychiatrist, any kind of counselor, uh, a substance abuse counselor or whatever, or, or multiple kinds of uh, fields of, of uh, whether it's dealing with uh, this marginally schizophrenic or whatever, uh, uh, the functional schizophrenic, not marginally, but functionally schizophrenic. 
telepsychiatry is a way that you can reach out into the community, keep the people in their community with, with their support system there, uh, instead of making them want, come once a month or once every three months to sit, sit for an hour in a psychiatrist's office. The efficiencies become uh, uh, amazing. Of course, cybersecurity of, in all these areas is incredibly important. Uh, it, however, it does allow more frequent encounters. Um, and um, as we know, one, one time on the couch with a psychiatrist once a month or every two or three months, how much can that really help? In many cases, people need to have counseling or have involvement from someone either at least on a weekly basis, maybe even a daily basis. And telepsychiatry or that, that field, hooking people up like that, um, has the, the possibility of doing that. It offers the possibility of a greater range of services. You might not have uh, the, the uh, psychi psychiatric or counseling services on your campus that address a particular problem, but you can reach out and grab them uh, through telepsychiatry. Obviously, it uh, deals with uh, convenience. And the, the thing that people always want to say is, what about that human touch? And uh, there's been some really good studies that show that people are actually more comfortable uh, talking uh, to a screen uh, than a person because of the feeling of anonymity. Number one, and this is the reason I put it number one, because this is the one that has the ability to crash the system in any local hospital, and that is geriatrics. Um, everybody knows that 60% of your life uh, um, expenditure on healthcare will come in the last two years of your life, okay? And we are having more and more and more uh, baby boomers uh, entering their later years, and their consumption of care is uh, just incredible. Um, and so the, the goal is to keep elderly patients out of the hospital. And that's not to deny care, but that's to put people in the hospital who should be there and keep those out who should not be there. Um, teletriage, and, and, and I mention this because it, as an ER doctor at night, I experience this almost every night of my practice. Uh, the uh, nighttime LPN at local nursing home comes on, and uh, Margaret just doesn't look like she did last week before the nighttime nurse went on vacation. And as a result of that, they scoop her up, spend $1,500 on an ambulance, send her over to my ER, spend another $1,500, and I know very little about her. She can't tell me anything about herself for the most part. And maybe the records come with her, maybe they don't. And this has an, the, the ability, if I could see her before I came with records, I could screen out probably half of the transfers that come to my ER. Because once they get to my ER, they're likely to be admitted and an expense goes through the roof. So any hospital that has uh, uh, global budgeting, again, I keep going back to this, pay for value, uh, that, that concept, there's an immediate impact, immediate, because we are able to, to deal with the staff before the patient is transferred. It's a win-win for doctors and hospitals because the doctors will continue to get paid and the hospitals will not get uh, dinged for admitting somebody who doesn't need to be admitted. Remember that hospitals are being penalized, penalized for patients who are readmitted in 30 days and it happens all the time with chronically ill with the geriatric patients. It brings the physician many times to the bedside before the transport. Um, there are all kinds of bots where the patient and the, and the staff can see the, uh, the physician and deal with them on, on a personal basis, but more importantly, the emergency physician can see the records and the patient themselves before, they, before they're sent. It allows nursing home efficiencies and staffing because anytime you, you have to have 24-7 availability of medical and skilled, really skilled nursing, the cost of nursing care goes up and up and up. And by allowing uh, telemedicine and telegeriatric triage to, to be present, you're able to go back down to levels of uh, nighttime nursing care particularly uh, that are more cost efficient. So uh, that's my top five, and uh, I got through them pretty quick, but those are my shiny toys. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for that in there. So I actually, but I agree with all your assessment. Uh, but I guess that's the thing I wonder. For example, take the um, <clears throat> take the dermatology services. So like last year, the ATA they had a famous you know talk about the quality of these. Or a lot of direct to consumer is was not that good. I mean, do you feel that was just because the business model was they're not paying enough to the doctors? Is that poor quality doctor? Or is there something 
intrinsic about right. like what do you need to go through fun like this where like the, all the AMA, the bad news that come out from the study to do right. something truly like you know. Right. I, I think that uh, we I think that um, clinicians jumped into it before they were uh, really qualified to do it. And that's the reason why I, I narrowed the field to the idea of um, melanomas. I think that's the question. I don't think every clinician can recognize uh, all the various rashes and bizarre things that, that present. But I think that the public, the, the vast majority of the public, has one or more lesions that they have questions about. And those, those you could be trying to say, uh, that's 50% likely to be uh, a melanoma, and that needs to be biopsied. Those kinds of diagnoses can be done. Milton, I have a thought. I'm glad you brought that up. I think there is that element that you're referring to for prior to getting into that market, but I also think there's an element of a lack of, of vetting of the companies that are in the market. For a consumer who has a concern, there's, there's no place yet for them to go to learn which of these 15 telederm companies is really is really the good one. And um, I've heard some pretty frightening studies out there of what happens when you send the same Google yeah. or mole to every telederm company in your state. You get 20 different results. And um, there needs to be some very clear ways of, of knowing the quality of these products. Right? Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we have the same problem with chest x-rays. You can send a chest x-ray to 15 different radiologists and unfortunately, the variation is pretty dramatic. Uh, and so that's really something that we have in healthcare, period. Uh, so what I'm suggesting with teledermatology is to set the bar relatively low. We're not telling you that this is cancer. We're telling you that the, the likelihood that this would, would uh, reach cancer is high enough that you need to, need to see somebody. Yeah. So you're saying the problem is doctors. Yep, I am. <laughs> Human error. I am. I am. Uh, you know, I, I'm just simply saying uh, it, it's not just the system. You have to populate the system with qualified people. You, if, if, you're, if your uh, clinic has quality physicians in it, you're going to have, you're going to corner the market. Yeah, that makes sense. That sense. I think Mark had another uh, question. So, I, like, the, I love the thing about the whole the uh, final point about how the elderly care is. This, I think it makes total sense, right? That is where all the big costs in the, in fact, the way I view the market is right. That the the first way a telemedicine company from the American world, the teledoc of the world, MD Life, and they right. So it's really focused on that, you know, like low acuity ish type of thing. In some cases, even if you do a perfect job, the impact on the overall healthcare is very modest at best. Right. But versus when you deal with that last couple of years of life, is it makes total sense there. But there's tons of company has been so tackling that space. I feel like the, you know, what is? Do you have any insight to actually? For some business to become maybe a truly successful, in that we're just seeing like company like crack level and no one has able to like get going almost. It's just feeling like maybe the market is so difficult to like. Yeah, I, 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 but you see, I'm a small business guy. I'm a small business guy, so I think that an individual medical group that's contracting with four, five, six nursing homes, that's a pretty good size. That's a nice business. There's no reason for it to be an international. Uh, conglomerate. Uh, you know, I, I think that that if if again, this is the the two lane road. This is the two lane road uh, approach here. There you go. You, you see what I'm, I'm looking at you over there. I have, say, I have a different perspective. Uh, I'm, thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking of uh, the company that I think that is really nailing this is a company called Call Nine, and I, I almost hesitate to even say that their name because they are trying to stay in some kind of stealth mode. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> I just have blow the cover. <laughs> but no, no, they're not really in stealth mode. But uh, I really applaud what they're doing, and they are working with uh, nursing facilities, and they're providing a twenty-four-seven um, video consults with an emergency physician. But the the secret sauce for them was not getting five or six contracts. The secret sauce was uh, knowing exactly how to talk to insurance companies mm -hmm. and knowing, like cracking the code on getting paid for value. And they, they cracked that code with the insurance company first, and then they could go to nursing homes. And once they did that, it just started falling down 
one after another. They did not go nursing home to nursing home to create different contracts for everybody. Um, they went for the payment model first. But he's the business guy. Okay, <laughs> he's the business guy. I'm the clinician. I'm just telling you that there is opportunity there and it's probably the number one opportunity right now because there is a market for keeping people out of the hospital and if clinicians can crack that market by talking to the insurance company, okay, and then you have a whole a whole business uh, model right here for clinicians. If there are clinicians out there listening to us today, then they need to understand that there are patients coming, every time a patient comes from a nursing home to an ER without having been pre-triaged, then that's, that is part of the market that we could, we could crack. And, and it becomes a win-win. Doctors get paid, okay? Hospitals don't get penalized and patients get to stay where they are. It's a win-win-win. No, I One final word, I will say that I agree with you in that the work that's happening with Call 9 is primarily concentrated around the New York tri-state area. And so I think that um, a lot of things happen in urban areas that um, are a few years ahead of the rest of the country, which yeah. means I'm saying you can look to them for opportunity. It means those opportunities exist in 98% of the country, and those places have not been... Uh, those networks have not been pulled together yet. So I would say um, in most of the country, you're absolutely right. No, makes sense. So we have a, um, a question from the audience that I read to you. Uh, so, so he was saying, so in, for example, all these were five telemedicine areas in there. So a lot of them are, there's a lot of companies already chasing after all five of these markets. I mean, do you see any like the gaps in the market today? Like if you were to maybe give advice to some new maybe entrepreneur, like how do you see maybe like, some Gabby might be easy. Yeah. I, I have <laughs> I, I have something that I desperately need to have, and, and my son probably knows the person who's already doing it, okay? But I, I believe that uh, the front-end history taking right okay. now, uh, we have all these algorithms. He was talking about uh, a company that was doing the algorithm as trying to make the diagnosis for you. I frankly think that's not going to be useful. It's like having a, an autopilot without a, without a pilot in the, in the cockpit, okay? Uh, I think that there needs to be uh, a program that gathers the history that, that and I, this is already sort of happening from the standpoint of ask, working down the, the decision tree. You have abdominal pain. Where's the abdominal pain? You ask all the questions that are appropriate to the abdominal pain. Include the review of systems. The problem right now is that when that information comes out, it's not packaged in a usable format. Uh, because in actual fact, this very thing is done by an intern or resident, and he uses his brain to then synthesize it and present it to me as an attending in 30 seconds. And I can make the diagnosis in 30 seconds if you pick out the appropriate information. Okay, and and it's okay if you have uh, <laughs> navigator. I know, <laughs> you know, but health navigator though is trying to tell you what it is. Okay, no, it's not. Health navigator is uh, is the autopilot. Okay, it's, it's, I'm it's not promoting, I'm not promoting the company, but you and I have had this conversation a lot, and uh, <laughs> they're a new company to me, and I think they're. They're beginning to do what you're talking about. Uh, as I said, he probably knows um, somebody who's already doing what I need to have. I just haven't found them yet. But I think that that I think that that is a, a big, big opportunity. And I think that when that that system becomes interoperable with all the various history pro where it could be transmitted to a doctor's office, to an ER, to uh, to other places, when that 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 labor that time intensive history taking becomes uh, condense, condensable and understandable. No, that, that's really good advice. I, I, I do, I'm, as a formally trained designer and the human factor, it's just a, the difference of how you present the information has a huge right. impact. In fact, our hypothesis for the whole telehealth industry is most of these telehealth systems today, just too many clicks, is actually is very bad for the provider in terms of productivity. And that's why it hasn't taken off in there. And in general, we think like between the three P's, right? Patients love it because it's convenient. Payers love it because they distribute the cost. And the provider, not so much because the incentive for them is not that high. It's not like they're going to get more paid if they do telemedicine, but now you're giving them all that extra work dealing with complex user interface. And 
no wonder people are not that like crazy. I, I, was, I was a consultant for an ER that their door to doctor time was 70 minutes, 70 minutes. So we went in and we looked in to, to see where the doctors were spending their time. And they were spending two minutes for at the computer for every one minute they spent at the bedside. Yeah. Okay. And we, we went in and looked at their systems, revamped their systems, and went from 70-minute door-to-doctor to seven-minute door-to-doctor. Okay. Okay. And, and that's when you have a system that really helps you. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Uh, we have another question from uh, <clears throat> John in the audience. So, so the question is, um, so what are your thoughts on in terms of like a school-based telehealth programs in there? Do you feel like this is a new hot trend where this has pretty become the norm? Uh, uh, we've written about telehealth in schools a couple of times, and um, I couldn't be more excited about the positive impact of telemedicine in schools, particularly for rural areas. Um, the data coming out uh, has been incredibly positive in terms of keeping, um, keeping parents at work, keeping kids in school longer. Uh, when they add up the number of days that um, telehealth in schools gains back for parents uh, in terms of the economy. I mean, it's millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you think about lost productivity, think about a, a single parent um, with a child with a, with a slight cough, uh, and you got a worried school nurse. So the idea of being able to treat them in place, keep them in school a little bit longer is fantastic. I guess we're looking at it like Sorry, I, I will just simply say that this, the, the school nurse uh, issue is the opposite uh, of the calendar of the uh, nursing home. Put yourself in the role of a school nurse. She's got zero backup, zero lab, and, and with a little kid with almost no history, okay? And the kid tells her something, you know, she has no clue or he has no clue whether this is serious or not. And the, the knee-jerk uh, response is, just like the knee-jerk response of the nighttime nurse in the nursing home is, send them to the ER, send them home. Yeah. And that has huge ripples with, within the family. The mother or father have to come home from work. They, go to, they naturally end up going to the ER because they want the kid going back to school. Uh, no, I, he's absolutely right. Uh, the school-based telemedicine has huge potential. God, I guess well, like in terms of schools in there. So, for example, at BC, we have this where SDKs where we license with a bunch of people in there. We see um, people when going to the school, right, it's unclear how they will make money or pay for it in there. I mean, do you see this is something where and the value created for everyone is clear, but who will actually pay for these services? Is it more that like, do you see? It's, you know, like, well, you're going to have to convince. I, I think you're going to have to convince uh, school systems. Uh, uh, that it's worth, uh, and, and this goes all the way to the state, okay, okay? Uh, and to the uh, local government that paying for school because, you know, I'm a, I'm a politician actually. I think you just gave me a great idea <laughs> because if a school was willing, if a state was willing to uh, institute a telemedicine service that would cover all their schools, okay. They would keep kids in school, all these uh, phony baloney complaints. They would yeah. keep parents at work, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, and it would, uh, it would more than pay for itself. Uh, you could, you could uh, I, I don't know, you, you could have some sort of an enrollment uh, from the parents' uh, perspective, a small fee, or it could just be picked up by the state. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In fact, um, so we've been advising a lot of these companies who like, let's say, like to go. We actually say, so, you know, that market is, right, is, it's because so difficult to make money because of the legislation or anything. It's almost like you try to solve a problem that many times above your pay grade. So you should actually stay away from that because it's going to be make create value, but you're not going to make you know make money out of it. Then you're going to have a you know difficult time. Right. To, yeah. right. I think you might have to actually go to the uh, start at the school level or even the yeah. state level to authorize uh, something like that, and then you know. If you made the case for it and the legislature uh, bought into it, uh, they might, who knows, politicians, they might hand you uh, a bucket load of money to do something. No, 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 no. I, I, also, I also think it speaks to the idea of consolidation within the market because um, there's, not a, there's not a business case for a small company to try to uh, service, let's say, six schools. There just isn't. 
But if you have a hub and spoke model and you have got a great central digital hospital, I'm thinking of somewhere like Avera eCare in Sioux Falls, uh, yeah. you're already doing telemedicine at 300 facilities and to add on 14 schools is almost nothing. Uh, yeah. You just fold them into the system. And at that case, you're not trying to squeeze more and more dollars. You know, you get a little bit of grant funding from the state, you add on the 14 schools, and you've done something good for, for everybody. Wow, okay, I love that. That makes total sense there. <laughs> um, we have another question from Jonathan in the audience. So, like, so we talk about like the qualities of these sort of different telemedicine companies in terms of from that dermatology first thing. So what um, what framework would you recommend? You know, for, for example, for the general population to vet these companies, is it like ATA credentialing, joint commission? Is it some other right. way? Like, how, how do I know me as a consumer? Let's say, how do I go about it? I'm, I'm on the other side, and you're over here. Right? <laughs> uh, that, it literally doesn't exist yet. It's something. Point you this way? Okay. So, so you go sound that longer, right? So you go ahead. Depends on uh, everyone's viewer, I guess. Uh, Milton, I believe this truly does not exist yet. It's, we are in talks right now about creating a project that would help do this for consumers. There are um, accrediting bodies like, like URAC, URAC out of, out of Washington, D.C. Um, that do work like this in telemedicine, but um, it's more of a gold star for the best in the business rather than I think what the industry needs is more of a like a CNET, like a more of a consumer friendly website that really will give you the down and dirty, um, or a website like Wirecutter where you can say uh, best telesite program and just read about them. So it's it's a it's a it's a niche, and uh, you know it's something that we're looking into doing in order to help the the public. But I don't believe it's being done yet. Uh, okay, that'll be a extremely valuable service. I always feel like, I want to sincerely thank you guys, but I feel like, Logan, if you could create that service for a huge, for the whole industry, for the consumer, that I just like, pilot, go, 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 and uh, Mark, if you can share for the legislation for the school, I feel like the impact and the, the society, I'm just like applauding you guys, like, <laughs> do your great work and, you know, help the rest of us. And, uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank <laughs> Uh, as we're coming, down, I apologize for the audience. And we have a bunch of questions queued up. I apologize to the audience. We're not able to get to your question, but we will pass these questions back to to Mark and Logan. Then we'll post them after the uh, uh, webinar, so you can see some of the answers there. Again, so as we're closing the uh, webinar, I would like to maybe ask uh, maybe it's for a three question. But the first question is like, uh, you guys uh, share a bunch of things that's really insightful today. If you if the audience can only learn one thing from you today, like, like what would you want the audience to learn from you? What is that one thing? Your youngest, you get to you get. To <laughs> um, I think I'll pull from uh, the points that I was going for, and uh, even though I appreciate the pragmatism um, of our elder statesmen, I would say uh, think. Think big and think for the future, and it's it's really worth it to do the extra work, even if it seems humble, if it seems like you're building zippers uh, to create the building blocks that will be sustainable for the future. I would say that with the gray tsunami coming, uh, we have to uh, have to figure out ways to keep uh, our uh, elders, uh, me being included in that, uh, we healthy and out of the hospital in low-cost settings because we have the ability to crash our healthcare system and our country in the process if we do not figure out how to treat our uh, the older patient uh, uh, compassionately with quality care with time uh, timeliness and I think that the, really the only way that, that we can do that is to develop a, a, an efficient uh, tele, uh, telehealth system. That makes a lot of sense. Then the next question is, um, so I mean, you guys have seen so many stuff from just like different companies, the trends in there. So um, what is this like uh, one thing in telehealth that you believe that the rest of the world do not believe yet? Mm. 
You go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I'm just going to go back to the uh, there was recently a RAND study. Okay. okay? A RAND study, which uh, tried to suggest that telemedicine uh, was not going to lower costs. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I think that um, uh, we we believe that telemedicine and te uh, is is going to lower costs in a variety of ways. And I think the RAND study was was. Uh, mm -hmm. The model was poor. I, th I mean, Rand has no axe to grind. But I think the way they went about it was was wrong. And I think as a result of that, we are plunging forward with the notion that tele telemedicine is going to reduce costs. And I think a lot of people don't are, are yet to be convinced of that. You know, I would, I think that there's a a myth that the future of telemedicine involves physicians working from home in their uh, you know, in a scrub top and pajama bottoms. Oh, don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a myth of like completely decentralized uh, healthcare. And the more I look into places like Mercy Virtual in Missouri and Avera in Sioux Falls, the more I think that the future of telemedicine is actually in digital hospitals, which is rel they're relatively rare right now. But um, what I see is a really high quality of life for the provider from these places because what I hear is that they love uh, the collegial atmosphere of talking to their colleagues about cases and they stand up and walk over to the tele-ICU department from the tele-ER department and they talk with somebody. And, and so I, I think those places are kind of somewhat unknown entities to the public right now, but I think that they have huge promise and I would um, I would see that as a very positive future uh, versus completely decentralized healthcare. That makes a lot of sense. Then the final uh, question is: um, So right, right now, I'm in the in the capital, the raging debates on healthcare is about these things. I know, like, so if we were to put away the partisanship of these things, like, for example, if we could whisper into President Trump's ear, plan one thought, one idea into him that he will execute, and what would be that one thing you want him to do? I'm going to say school-based telehealth. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it's a great, yeah, well, I don't know if that should be handled on the federal level. I have to give that some more thought, but it certainly seems to me like a fantastic public yeah. good. Nice. I would say um, centralized, uh, if you will, I hate to use the word, federalized uh, credentialing and licensure. Uh, I think there is no reason that we should have 50 li uh, state license boards. Uh, I think that um, a doctor in Sioux Falls should be able to treat a, a patient in Maryland. Uh, I think that when we do that, then we'll start to see economies of scale and, and time efficiencies. And, and I mean, right now I work in the ER at night and the doctor re reading my CTs are, is in Australia. Okay. He's in Australia. Why? Because he's wide awake. Okay. All my radiologists are asleep. Okay. And, and I think that um, that when we start to break down these state barriers and have credentialing that goes across and allows people to practice essentially uh, all over the United States, and I, I think we're going to start to see efficiencies there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Friday. This is a fantastic. Uh, you guys are like share so much wisdom, your insight. Again, though, I'm thank you, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so, Again, for the audience, um, again, so all the, the slides will be posted. We're going to make the recording available. We also have the questions we didn't get to apologize in there. So I just have too many questions. Again, all those things will be posted on the web page. Again, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Great. Thanks.